GeForce Now, powered by CloudGG, is having one of their biggest weeks ever with the arrival of Battle.net heavy hitters like Call of Duty HQ, Diablo 4, Overwatch 2, and Hearthstone. Play it up to 4K 60fps with their all-new Ultra tier, giving you access to cutting-edge PC performance at a fraction of the price of having to buy the hardware outright. Click below to check it out for free or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Gamers, let me say right off the top that I know it sucks to have to keep hearing about layoffs week after week, either because you care and you are dispirited by the news, or because you don't care and you're like, dude, I'm sick of hearing about this, talk about something else. I get that perspective, but I have never subscribed to it. I like to think that this is a channel that is just as focused on the industry as it is the games themselves, and it's impossible to properly cover this industry without properly covering the epidemic of layoffs that currently besiege it. Case in point, just weeks after Xbox announced massive cuts, and literally less than a week after Sony announced similar cuts, Electronic Arts announced that they were affecting a round of layoffs exiting 5% of their workforce, or approximately 670 people worldwide. CEO Andrew Wilson farted out the same vapid corporate word salad oppressor that everyone in his position does when it's time to indiscriminately sack people, quote, This greater focus allows us to drive creativity, accelerate innovation, and double down on our biggest opportunities, including our own IPs, sports, and massive online communities, to deliver the entertainment players want today and tomorrow, end quote. Most infuriatingly, Andrew Wilson said that EA, quote, deeply considered every option to try to limit impacts to our teams, end quote. But he made no mention of if he or any of his fellow executives would be taking a pay cut, because obviously they wouldn't be. Interesting to note that he alone took home nearly $21 million last year, but maybe he already considers that a pay cut because in 2021, he took home $39 million. The following year, shareholders voted against the executive remuneration package put to them, one of the very, very rare instances where shareholders rejected a pay package for being too greedy. Also important to note is the fact that in 2022, EA announced a $2.6 billion stock buyback program, and every quarter since then, they've bought back around $300 million worth of stock. If we average out employee pay at around about $100,000 a year, then one single quarter of EA stock buyback could have kept all 670 sacked game workers in the job for an additional four years, and the entire stock buyback program could have kept them all employed for a full 32 years. CEO pay and stock buybacks are all helpful numbers to keep in your head whenever a CEO tells you that they did everything in their power to avoid layoffs. Sometimes it is true, absolutely, but a lot of the time it is bullshit just like as it is here with EA. Either way, these cuts are happening and they signal a shift on the part of EA away from licensed IP and toward their owned properties. This is evidenced by the fact that Wilson said as much in his address, but also by the fact that EA has cancelled the Star Wars first person shooter that Respawn was working on, heavily rumored to be based on The Mandalorian. The cancellation was confirmed by EA president Laura Meal, who said, quote, it's always hard to walk away from a project and this decision is not a reflection of the team's talent, tenacity or passion. They have have for the game. Giving fans the next installments of the iconic franchises they want is the definition of blockbuster storytelling and the right place to focus." End quote. Well, first of all, that is not the definition of blockbuster storytelling, what the fuck are you talking about? And secondly, if new installments in iconic franchises are your focus, why the hell are you cancelling a shooter based on The Mandalorian made by Respawn? I feel like statements from executives are just written by AI at this point, like they all have the words you expect to see, but put together in a way that says absolutely nothing. She concludes her statement by saying, quote, I will never lose sight of the human impact of these decisions and know that change and disruption aren't easy. In difficult moments, we must remember how important it is to show up for our players and each other, end quote. Laura Meal made $11 million last year. So if Respawn aren't working on a Star Wars shooter, then what are they working on? Well, probably something Titanfall related, but not Titanfall 3. Jeff Grubb was speaking about this yesterday, and he says that there is a team at Respawn working on something set in the Titanfall universe, but he was emphatic that that is not Titanfall 3, at least not at this stage. Don't forget that Apex Legends is technically set in the Titanfall universe, so that's a pretty wide net, and we definitely shouldn't get our hopes up about a return to actual Titans actually falling. So what else are Respawn working on then? Well, they haven't given up on licensed IP completely as they're still working on a new Jedi game to complete that trilogy, and EA has since confirmed that Respawn are overseeing the development of a Star Wars strategy game over at Bitreactor. No other details other than it still exists, so that's something at least. Related to this, EA also confirmed that work continues on EA Motive's Iron Man game 
and Amy Hennig's Captain America and Black Panther game. These layoffs and strategy pivots seem to have had a rather profound effect on the Battlefield franchise since it's seen the closure of one studio. Ridgeline Games was co-founded by Marcus Leto back in 2022. He had previously worked at Bungie and played a leadership role during the development of Halo 1 before setting up V1 Interactive, a studio that folded after the failure of an action strategy hybrid game called Disintegration. Ridgeline was founded with the express purpose of leading Battlefield's single player content and you got the feeling that they were shooting for more than just a lightweight campaign bolted onto the next Battlefield release. Leto actually left the studio he co-founded two weeks ago saying it was his own decision and following that EA announced last week that the studio would be shuttered and its work handed over to Criterion who previously worked on Burnout and Need for Speed games but are now doing this stuff. Some of the Ridgeline employees will be relocated to other studios, while the others will be let go, joining the over 8,300 game workers who have lost their jobs in the past nine weeks alone. Oh, sorry, did I say 8,300? Time to update that number with a brief whip around at other layoffs that happened just this week alone. Deck Nine, the team behind Life is Strange, Before the Storm, and The Expanse announced they were cutting 150 staff. The ESL, owned by the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund, announced they were cutting 15% of their staff, which equates to just over 100 positions. Wildfire Studios is a mobile studio, and they're having their third consecutive year of layoffs, cutting 133 people this round alone. Radical Forge is a small studio who previously worked on Sea of Thieves, and they lost six people. And to top it all off, Australian-based Taurus Games have closed down after 30 years in operation, with about half a dozen job losses there as well. All those tallied up brings this week's job losses to just over a thousand people people in a single week and roughly 8,700 year to date. And I know what some people are thinking. They're like, well, that's just business, man. This is all business as usual. It's, it's normal. But I want to be clear that the scale of this is not actually normal. If you don't believe me, take it from veteran game maker John Romero, quote, I've been in the games industry since I was a kid and I've never seen anything like we're seeing now. For many of us, being a game dev is not just a job, but an identity, community, and culture. I am so sorry to everyone who has lost their jobs, end quote. The scale of these cuts is a genuine first for this industry. Some suggest that it's part of a crash or the bubble bursting, but it is not. Video game companies continue to be extremely profitable, especially the likes of EA. The majority of these cuts are not to keep these companies afloat, but rather to keep the line going endlessly up no matter what. And I think we should keep that firmly front of mind whenever someone earning between 20 and 40 million dollars a year says that they did everything in their power to avoid laying off staff. Speaking of dumbass executives, Warner Brothers. Remember Harry Potter, the single player offline AAA game that sold absolutely gangbusters, becoming the highest selling game of 2023? Back then we all joked that the lesson Warner Brothers executives would probably take from this is, we should have made it a live service. Well, guess what? They said the thing. They actually said it when just last night, Warner Brothers gaming boss Jay Perrottet said, quote, rather than just launching a one and done console game, how do we develop a game around, for example, a Hogwarts Legacy or Harry Potter that is a live service where people can live and work and build and play in that world in an ongoing basis, end quote. All of this was said in the context of a broader announcement that Warner Brothers notes the volatility of the AAA space, saying that they plan to double down on live services, mobile games, and free-to-play games. He'd go on to cite Suicide Squad as an example of that AAA volatility, without mentioning that all but a thimbleful's worth of live service games over the past 10 years have flopped. It's like you can't claim Suicide Squad as an example of AAA riskiness without also signing it as proof positive that live services are way, way more risky. But that is how these executives think. They will honestly look at the single biggest selling game of 2023 and think, we could have made more money by doing the opposite of the thing that made us successful. Absolute clowns, all of them. Speaking of clowns, Embracer Group. Man, we are really on a roll today. You will no doubt recall that Embracer Group is drowning in a sea of debt, owing to all of the fast money that they signed on to and the sudden withdrawal of the Saudis in a deal that would have bailed Embracer out. As such, they've been sacking people, canceling projects and closing studios. Now it seems they're ready to sell off two of their largest holdings. Jason Schreier of Bloomberg is reporting that Embracer is close to selling Sabre Interactive for a deal worth roughly $500 million. It'll be sold to a consortium of private investors, and as part of this deal, development will continue on the Knights of the Old Republic remake, a project long feared doom since it was taken off Aspire Media and given to Sabre, who since then have provided no major updates on the project status. Sabre are kind of low-key the crown jewel in Embracer's crown, but they don't get nearly enough credit for how much they do. 
In addition to successful in-house projects like SnowRunner and World War Z, they also have a fairly vast publishing label that puts out stuff like the Metro games and Insurgency Sandstorm. They're currently at work developing Space Marine 2, which I played and it's awesome. This is a serious outfit and Embracer being willing to part with them shows just how desperate Embracer is right now, which I guess is no secret since all you need to do is look at their monthly interest expense to get a pretty clear picture of where things are at. But wait, there's more. Remember how Embracer also bought Gearbox, the studio behind Borderlands? Well, rumor has it that and Embracer are pretty close to selling them too. Kotaku was reporting, quote, Gearbox CEO and co-founder Randy Pitchford held a town hall with staff earlier this week in which he told employees that a decision had been made regarding the studio's future with more information to be shared next month, according to two sources familiar with the meeting, end quote. When asked for comment, Pitchford responded to Kotaku with this, quote, I'm delighted that what we might be up to is interesting enough to people that you might want to make a story about us for your readers. I'm honored and humbled that our company is a topic of rumor, speculation, and discussion, end quote. It's like, Randy, why can't you just be normal for just one minute? Anyway, Gearbox is another very big part of Embracer because it too has a big game in Borderlands and more recently, Tiny Tina. They have a movie coming out and they've also got their own publishing label putting out solid stuff like Risk of Rain 2, the upcoming Gigantic Revival, and the upcoming Homeworld 3. Another big L for Embracer Group. We'll be very interested to see who ends up snapping up Gearbox. The other very big news this week is Nintendo taking action against Yuzu, the emulator for Nintendo Switch. Last week, they brought suit against the company who oversees the development of Yuzu, a company called Tropic Haze. Nintendo sought to have the emulator taken down and they also sought damages, citing the claim that over 1 million people had downloaded ROMs for just Tears of the Kingdom, and the fact that many ROMs had been leaked prior to a game's release, which has resulted in not only lost sales, but also spoilers. So this is a really complicated one to talk about because of the nature of Tropic Haze. They were running a Patreon that was paywalling new versions of the emulator, so in effect, Tropic Haze were profiting from this, or at least making money that was going into the development team's pockets to reimburse them for their dev time. This is a red line that you'll see many companies draw when it comes to fan projects and initiatives. Generally speaking, companies either can't or choose not to pursue legal action when their IP is being used for non-profit making endeavors. But when you start charging for work that leverages that IP, that's when companies have a much stronger legal case and they're also incentivized to want to make an example of you. That's almost certainly what put Yuzu in Nintendo's crosshairs. The other factor is that it's an emulator of a current gen console. The emulation scene is usually pretty focused on consoles from previous generations, but Yuzu really was costing Nintendo actual money because you didn't have to buy Nintendo Switch games when they released on day one, you could just emulate them. And in many instances, you could get them before day one. Tropic Haze could clearly see the writing on the wall with this one, and so just days after the suit was brought, it was mutually settled by both parties. Tropic Haze would have to pay $2.4 million in damages, an amount they probably can't pay, so this effectively just bankrupts their organization. They also have to hand over any of their work and distribution of Yuzu, and the developers on the project are forbidden from working on any other emulation projects. Some speculate that this quick resolution was to avoid discovery, a process where Nintendo would have been granted unfettered access to Tropic Haze's inner workings and data repositories. While Tropic Haze was always outwardly saying they were against piracy, they were also shipping updates that made new Switch games playable on day one, meaning they were almost certainly developed using illegally obtained cart dumps. That in itself is a bit of a smoking gun. There are different views around piracy versus emulation, and that's a whole discussion that is too big to get into here. Bottom line, I do agree that if you can get Tears of the Kingdom before it's actually out, without having to pay for it, and you can play that on hardware that Nintendo did not sell you, and then if a million people got it that way, that's a problem that Nintendo has a right to solve. At the same time, the emulation scene is vital because we cannot rely on companies to guarantee long-term access to games, and that's an issue that's going to become even more pressing in the inevitable all-digital future, where physical media is all but gone. Emulation is legal and important, and I really hope this case doesn't have a chilling impact on the broader emulation scene, and that other emulators aren't taken down as a result of it, but one of the byproducts of this is that the 3DS emulator Citra has also been taken down since it was being overseen by Tropic Haze. This settlement doesn't create a legal precedent that might change the rules around emulation, but it does signal some very uncertain times ahead. A quick lightning round to finish off. Remember that scan from a few weeks back where someone renamed their Steam listing to the day before, hoping to trick people into purchasing it? Well, they seem to have inspired a whole new type of Steam scam, as evidenced by the fact that over the past two weeks, two separate scammers have renamed their games Helldivers 2, offering them at a steep discount in the hope of ensnaring bargain hunters. Steam has since delisted the titles. It's not exactly clear who's responsible 
responsible for this brazen act of storefront manipulation, but given its technical sophistication, I think it's pretty clear the automatons are behind this one. Rumor mill time, so be sure to pinch that salt. Jeff Grubb is reporting that Dragon Age Dreadwolf will launch this year. Quote, it will be released this year. Last I heard, they're pretty confident about that. Doesn't mean it's a guarantee, could slip, but right now, internally, they expect to release it later this year, end quote. Very much hoping that Bioware knocks it out of the park with that one because it really does feel like a bit of a make or break moment for that studio. Rockstar Games is forcing its staff back into the office for a full five days a week, citing productivity and security as the reason. Good news though, Rockstar employees can still work from home on Saturdays and Sundays, so that's something, right? I'm of course joking, they did not say that. Bloomberg has the scoop on this, citing an internal memo that said that the move allows the company to hit their desired quality bar, but we've had plenty of exceptional games shipped by partially or fully remote teams, so that line doesn't hold much water. Employees are not thrilled about the move. Jason Schreier spoke to a number of them who expressed dissatisfaction. One of them saying, quote, after so many broken promises, we now fear management may even be paving the way for a return to toxic crunch practices. Senior leadership need to rethink their reckless decision-making and engage with their staff staff to find an arrangement that works for everyone, end quote. In reality, this move is likely a means of affecting a round of layoffs without having to pay severance, as numerous people will not be willing or able to meet the five-day mandate and just self-select out. That is, of course, unconfirmed speculation. The workers' union representing a number of Rockstar employees has expressed disappointment at the move. Something tells me this story is far from over, so stay tuned. Last year, FromSoft acquired the Elden Ring IP from publisher Bandai Namco, and this week, Remedy announced that they'd secured the Control IP from publisher 505 Games. These are unusual moves, since publishers typically hold onto their IPs with an iron vice, and perhaps these deals signal a trend toward more studio-owned IP development, surely a better outcome since it gives studios more creative control and commercial freedom. Interestingly, Remedy purchased it for 17 million euros, which they claim is the amount spent on the development of Control 2 and another project currently codenamed Condor. This indicates that 505 were essentially just looking to recoup their expenses, meaning that they're perhaps a little cash-strapped at the moment. Incidentally, 505 just announced that they were closing a number of offices and laying off 10 staff, so clearly 505 are going through some belt tightening. Ubisoft won't say how many copies Skull and Bones has sold or how many people are playing it, but they are crowing about how long people are playing it for? Yubi released a presser saying, quote, Skull and Bones has achieved record player engagement with over four hours of average daily playtime, the second highest ever at Ubisoft, end quote. And that's like, okay, cool, but how many people are playing it? That four hours a day, is that during the campaign and then people immediately drop off and never touch it again? Like, is the average measured over a single day or a month? Because those are likely to be very different numbers. One thing we can say though, is that Assassin's Creed Black Flag's numbers are way up, at least on Steam. Prior to the release of Skull and Bones, the game was averaging an already impressive peak daily concurrent player count of around a thousand people, which for reference is roughly twice the number of people currently playing Suicide Squad. After Skull and Bones released, Black Flag's player count more than doubled and it's now averaging around 2700 peak daily concurrent players. I get it because I did exactly the same thing when I finished Skull and Bones. I just booted up Assassin's Creed Black Flag and let me tell you, that has not aged a day. Last of Us 2 director Neil Druckmann says he doesn't think he has many more big games left in him. Speaking on Logic's podcast, Druckmann said that Uncharted 2 was the most fun he'd had making a game and that he'd like to spend more time with his family in the future. He did comment that he enjoyed working in the TV space where he directed one of the episodes of the recent HBO series, so it's possible that this is him signaling a move to that side of the fence. He did recently confirm, however, that he has a story idea in mind for The Last of Us Part 3, so maybe he's got a few more big games in him yet. And finally, saying is low-key blaming Mario for Sonic Superstars not selling gangbusters. During an earnings call, a Sega executive was quizzed on Superstars' sales and he said, quote, Although Sonic Superstars has generally been well received by those who have played it, the timing of the launch coincided with competing titles in the same genre and it has been short of the initial forecast, end quote. Given that Mario Wonder launched three days after Sonic Superstars, it's not hard to imagine which game he's alluding to there. When it comes to sales, it seems like Nintendo does what Sega don't. Ooh, sick burn. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, Paranormal Activity found footage as the next thing from the team that delivered Mortuary Assistant, a little indie title that very much found its audience back in 2022. No details on what this is yet, but if you'd like to follow its development, you can do so over on Twitter. Dragon Ball Fighters just got a next-gen console update. It arrived on both PS5 and Xbox Series consoles on February 29th. It's a free update to all existing owners, and best of all, it delivers rollback netcode, a huge upgrade for any fighting game. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Arcade Wrath of the Mutants is is a port of the arcade-only game that arrived back in 2017. 
It was based on the 2012 run of the show, not the classic from way back in the day, and it features a pretty strong voice cast including Seth Green and Sean Astin. The at-home version of the game includes three new stages and six new boss battles, in addition to the original six stages and 13 boss fights. No date for this one yet, but it's headed to all platforms. Stardew Valley's long, long-awaited 1.6 update is arriving imminently. On the 19th of March, aka my birthday, Chucklefish will be celebrating the 8th anniversary of the game that has now sold over 30 million units. This new update is kind of a big deal, as it includes a new farm type, new major festival, a whole bunch of late game content, 100 new lines of dialogue, and PC support for 8 player multiplayer. Concerned Ape said that the update ended up larger in scope than he had initially planned, which is a line that basically sums up that whole man's career. I've never really been into these sorts of games, but I'm glad they exist for other people. I look forward to experiencing secondhand joy when that update arrives on March 19th. UFO 50 is a collection of 50 games either made by or curated by Derek Yu, the man behind Spelunky. These are 50 actual games, so no mini games or micro games, but actual games. And the law setup for this package is that it comes from a fictional 1980s video game company. This package was announced seven years ago and now has a release window confirmed. It'll hit PC only sometime in the second half of this year. Nacon held a showcase over the weekend where they showed off some Greedfall 2. Nice to see Spider sticking with that series. The biggest announcement of the show, however, was for Terminator Survivors, a survival game set in the Terminator universe. I can absolutely see that working, to be honest. We already had plenty of shooters and recently an RTS game, so why not a survival Terminator game as well? We only got a CG trailer for this one, so not much to go on, but it's scheduled to arrive in early access on October 24th, the 40-year anniversary of the Terminator franchise, and few things have ever made me feel older than the sentence, the 40 year anniversary of the Terminator franchise. No Rest for the Wicked is the next thing from Moon Studio, the team behind the seminal Ori games. Too early to judge this one yet, but from the previews it seems as though No Rest for the Wicked is on its way to being something damn impressive. Previews say that it's an absolutely beautiful, dense, smartly designed, top down action souls like that seems to be nailing everything that it's turned its attention to. If you're intrigued, luckily you won't have to wait too long as they also announced a release date. It's going to hit early access on April 18th, exclusive to PC for the start, but it will end up on consoles when it hits 1.0. And finally, no delay announcements this week, but one end of service announcement for Crash Team Rumble. Remember that one? No, you do not. No one does. It's the Crash game that absolutely no one asked for and seemingly no one played. As developer Toys for Bob announced that March 4th will be the last content update for the game with in-game purchases being turned off. As we mentioned earlier, Toys for Bob are about to go independent so they would have stopped working on this one anyway. But yeah, it was always really weird that this existed in the first place so this announcement is hardly surprising. So what came out last week? Well, that Brothers A Tale of Two Sons remake dropped and it's either pretty good or really shit depending on who you are ask. The game makes some big changes to art design, tinkers with some story beats and adds co-op play, which is kind of antithetical to the core conceit of the game which was previously reliant on controlling each brother with each of the thumbsticks. Steam reviews don't seem much impressed by it, it's sitting at a mix 63% at the time of writing, though critics seem to like it a lot more, putting it at a strong 81 on Open Critic. At the top end of the review spectrum are the likes of Press Start, who scored it a solid 8 out of 10, saying, quote, Just as it was 10 years ago, Brothers A Tale of Two Sons is a succinct yet economical adventure that wastes no time in delivering a beautiful and devastating co-op experience that through this remake can now be shared with another, even if that dilutes the game's novel concept as a result, end quote. At the other end of the spectrum is the unscored op-ed from PC Gamer, which excoriated the remake in a breathless broadside, quote, The art style of the original is warm and colourful. It evokes the feel of an old children's book, and though the character models are noticeably chunky to modern eyes, it's still often strikingly beautiful. The remake chucks that out the window, opting for a more realistic look that bulldozes the cosy atmosphere and evokes nothing but ancient Unreal tech demos, end quote. They'd sum it up by saying this, quote, There's no meaningful preservation happening here beyond, I suppose, putting a version of the game on current gen consoles. It reeks of cynical business decisions, end quote. Pretty brutal, so make sure you know what you're getting yourself into if you want to pick this one up. Nightdive Studios delivered their Star Wars Dark Forces remaster this past week, and reviews for it break the same way that they did for the System Shock remake, which is to say that Nightdive did a superb job in bringing these games to modern platforms, but these games are still full of old design foibles that can grate in the modern era. PC Gamer scored it a 78, saying, quote, The end result, then, is a great remaster of a game that offers very strictly a mid-1990s FPS experience. If you like slash liked that experience, then you'll love this as Dark Forces Remaster is the definitive version of this game to play. But if modern FPS trappings are what you're used to and you have no love for the original, you'll likely be left wanting." End quote. That one is out now, exclusive to PC. Biggest release of last week was Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Now you are no doubt wondering, Shill up. 
Where the fuck is the review? Here's the truth, right? At the time of writing, I'm 75 hours deep and I'm up to chapter 11 of 14. This game is absurdly large, but only if you're playing it like I am, where I'm kind of 100%ing it all the way through. In hindsight, that probably was not a good idea as it has put me severely behind schedule, but on the flip side, I'm loving it and I can't wait to start writing up that review. Other reviewers managed to get through the game much faster than I did though, and they're the ones that have contributed to the open critic score of a mighty 93, making this the highest rated modern Final Fantasy game. Games Hub scored this one a perfect 5 out of 5 saying, quote, This is what a good game does. It makes you feel, it makes you think. With grand set pieces and rich narrative turning points, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth consistently gives you a reason to care, to sit at the edge of your seat wide-eyed, wondering what the future holds, end quote. It is absolutely true, I could not agree more. GameSpot were one of the more critical reviews, so they still gave it an 8 out of 10, which is by no means a bad score. They did point to some pacing issues, and yeah, I do agree with that too. And they said that Rebirth fumbles some of the most important story moments, making them more opaque and convoluted than they were before. Quote, having to untangle a story in a desperate bid to make sense of it isn't what I wanted to be doing when the journey was complete, end quote. Even with these criticisms, GameSpot loved it, as did everyone. And looking at the chatter online, I'm yet to find a negative take on it, except on the open world stuff, which, yeah, it's a bit Ubisoft, but we'll talk about that more in the review. Bottom line, I fucking love Rebirth. It's incredible. And I can't wait for this week's new show script to be written so I can get back to playing it. If you're looking for some of that old school charm that perhaps don't sleep on Euphoria, the Saga 2, which launched on the Switch and PC last week, it's a sequel to a platformer that released in 1991, and the developers seem to have found the right formula to bring it into the modern era. Reviews for this one landed at a strong 81 on Open Critic. CGM scored it a 9 and said, quote, The more I played Euphoria the Saga 2, the more enraptured I became. While it seems so simple on the surface, it's a game that's so deeply layered and so incredibly likable, it makes me sad I couldn't experience it back in 1991, end quote. And finally, Expeditions Mud Runner is a game about driving a truck through the mud. That really is the whole thing, but it's well and truly enough if the reviews are to be believed, as it's sitting at a strong 83 on Open Critic. Push Square were impressed, scoring at an 8 and saying, quote, At its best, Expedition offers more of the absorbing, slow, and high-risk driving that made Mud Runner and Snow Runner such cult successes. It's a clever formula that now has slightly more user-friendly packaging, making it easier than ever to get into, end quote. So that was the week that was, but what about the week that is, aka what's coming out this week? Biggest release of the week has got to be Unicorn Overlord, the next thing out of Vanillaware, the studio that delivered cult classic 13 Sentinels, and before that, Dragon's Crown, a game famous for two very big reasons that I won't detail here lest I get demonetized. Unicorn Overlord is looking absolutely spectacular, but that's par for the course for the studio since their art design has always been S tier. It's a tactical role playing game with a sweeping narrative and a grand cast of characters. There's a demo ad for it now so you can try before you buy and progress for that carries over to the full game if you find yourself converted. Vanillaware releases have usually been locked behind some platform exclusive deals, but not this one. It arrives on all platforms tomorrow. There's a new WWE game coming. I could not possibly care any less, but my American friends, I hope you enjoy yourselves when this drops tomorrow for all platforms bar Switch. Konami are pumping out yet another Contra game, this one's called Operation Galuga, and it's definitely more Contra. To be honest, I tapped out of this series a long time ago, so I don't know how the more recent releases hold up, but if you want to find out for yourself, you can grab this on all platforms on March 12th. The literally smallest release of the week is also perhaps the most interesting ever since the play date was announced, they teased a new exclusive game from Lucas Pope the man behind both Papers, Please and Return of the Obra Dinn. This dude is a big deal, and the Playdate has wanted for a big headline-grabbing release to make that console known for more than just its novelty. So perhaps Mars After Midnight will be the game to deliver it to them. The setup is that you play as a bouncer at a Mars self-help community group, and you have to decide which monsters get let in and which ones get bounced. It kind of sounds like Papers, Please, but with aliens and somehow involves a hand crank, possibly. This one arrives on March 12th. I don't think I've touched my Playdate since I first got it, so I'm looking forward to checking in on that hardware to see how that library has expanded over the past two or so years. And finally, Llamasoft, the Jeff Minter story is that collection of classic Jeff Minter games we spoke about last week when its release date was locked in, and now that release date is here, it'll drop on all platforms on the 13th. All right, this next one's something I've been looking to profile in this section for a while now, so put this on your radar.
streaming is kind of fucked up when you really think about it. A bunch of people watching you, and it's not like television, which is kind of distant and impersonal. It's very much grounded in parasocial stuff. So what if, in addition to that, it was also grounded in a little bit of paranormal stuff? And also, it happened over 56k dial-up internet. That's the premise underpinning Dark Web Streamer, a horror game about, well, I don't really know to be honest with you, but it's definitely about streaming, and it's definitely scary, and the old web-style art direction goes super hard, and this just looks fascinating. The trailer alone is so arresting, and the way they're equating the streaming grind to the idea of a blood sacrifice is just, it's too on point. It's been on my radar for a long time now, as I've seen various updates for it all over Twitter and while there's no release date for it yet I've added it to my Steam wishlist if you'd like to do the same then I've left a link to it over on my Steam curator page which also has links to all the other put this on your radar stuff I've recently covered I'll leave a link to all of that below the like button so on a free stuff time now and it is the first week of the month so it's time to grab our goodies Epic has us covered as per usual right now they're still giving away Aerial Knights Never Yield but later in the week that'll be replaced by Astro Jewel 2 a brand new release which will be launching on the same day on Steam as a paid title it's a sci-fi themed 2D platformer supporting co-op play looks kind of cute prime gaming are having a bit of a slow month but from the 7th you can grab fallout 2 if you still haven't experienced that old school flavor there's also invincible adam eve available on the 14th which is based on the invincible spin-off tv show it's a visual novel thing and it's well timed given the release of the second half of invincible season 2 which arrives on the same day ps plus is the headline for this section this week i don't think i need to sell you on sifu but if i do it's basically the closest thing we have to an actual john wick video game and while it can be hard as hell it's absolutely fantastic and well worth checking out. EA Sports F123 is also available, as is Hello Neighbor 2, but the bumper offering this week is Destiny 2 Witch Queen, regarded by many as the single best campaign that Bungie have delivered in their post-Halo years, and yeah, I'd have to agree. Sony are obviously looking to pump prime the franchise at a time when player numbers and engagement are sorely lacking. Best of luck to them, because right now it does seem like Destiny 2 could do with a shot in the arm. Our feel-good story for the week involves one of the greatest events that 2024 has served up yet. I'm talking, of course, about the Glasgow Willy Wonka experience. If you haven't heard of this one, you have been missing out. A Facebook promotion for a Willy Wonka-themed children's event promised a veritable wonderland of candy and rainbows and oompa loompas and all that jazz. The only problem is that all the promotional artwork was made with AI and that instead of being an enchanting Willy Wonka themed event, the organizers delivered what was essentially the kids version of a fire festival. The shots of the sparsely decorated warehouse went viral, as did clips of the various attractions on offer, including a newly invented villain called the Unknown, whose job it was to just hide behind this mirror and jump out randomly, as well as this sad Oompa Loompa lady standing over what can only be charitably described as a meth lab. The images were so iconic that they inspired all manner of recreation, which is where video games come in. People said about recreating the scenes in various games. The Sims was an obvious starting point, especially given the flexibility of facial animations. Looks great. The flexibility of Fortnite's creation tools made for an easy W, the W being for Willy Wonka, of course. But the finest work was that profiled by Twitter user Haztec Camarera, who showcased not only a perfect recreation of the sad Oompa Loompa, not only a perfect recreation of the dire decor not only a one-to-one -one recreation of the hilariously miscast willy wonka but actual footage of the unknown doing her scary thing all right ladies and gents huge episode so thanks so much for staying right to the end if you had a good time learned a little something cracked a smile maybe then i'd love it if you could hit the like button on the video and if you're feeling generous we'd love it if you could subscribe and maybe even ding that notification bell we've got some very very big content planned for the next few weeks. Stuff I can't spoil yet, but I promise you it's a big deal and you're going to like it. So I do look forward to bringing that to you. In the meantime, I'm going to go back and play more Final Fantasy VII Rebirth because after 75 hours, there's still plenty more to go. Thanks again for stopping by and a big thanks to this week's sponsor, GeForce Now, powered by Cloud GG. All right, Australians, this next part is for you. We've had GeForce Now powered by CloudGG for a while now, and it's always been fantastic because it's the most affordable path into PC gaming, completely removing both the upfront costs and the ongoing costs associated with maintaining and upgrading your machine. If you're unfamiliar with it, GeForce Now is a powerful gaming platform that lets you play hundreds of games through the power and magic of the cloud, meaning you can play those games on your TV, your old outdated PC, your tablets, and even your Apple devices. This is possible because GeForce Now does all of the graphics 
graphical processing in the cloud and just beams you an image, similar to something like Netflix. So if you have an internet connection at 15 megabits per second or higher, you can start playing games through the cloud on almost any device through either a dedicated app or through a web browser like Apple Safari. GeForce Now has been around for a few years now, and the thing is, NVIDIA and CloudGG have never stopped improving it, both in relation to the games on offer and the technology that makes all of this possible. Every Thursday, new games are added to the service. Last month alone, 27 new games were added, including Deep Rock Galactic Survivor and Halo Infinite. This week, this very week, GeForce Now powered by CloudGG announced that a number of Battle.net titles will be joining the service. These include Call of Duty HQ, which is the hub that lets you play a whole bunch of different Call of Duty experiences, Overwatch 2 is also on there, as is Hearthstone, and my personal favorite, Diablo 4, all now fully playable in the cloud. But why would you want to play in the cloud, you ask? Well, a lot of reasons, but the main one is that it lets you experience cutting-edge PC performance at a fraction of the cost of having to buy all of that high-end PC hardware. GeForce Now, powered by CloudGG, has an all-new Ultra-Tier membership that gives you access to 4K 60fps or 1440p at 120fps. That 120fps number is significant because many modern TVs support 120fps. So you can play Diablo 4 on your TV at that frame rate if you want to without needing to spend hundreds of dollars on a console or thousands of dollars on a high-end PC. That Ultra tier also supports ultra-wide and ray tracing. Funnily enough, Diablo 4 supports ultra-wide and it just got a ray tracing update. With just a few clicks, you can be playing Diablo 4 max settings, ultra-wide, ray tracing enabled without having to spend like $5,000 on a new PC. Best of all, you don't have to buy your games twice. These games are pulled from your existing libraries, be it Steam, the Epic Store, or Ubisoft, meaning that you can continue to buy games wherever you please, but play them through the power and convenience of GeForce Now. There is a free trial available all the time, allowing you to test this for yourself, and for less than the price of a cup of coffee, you can get a full month of the basic tier membership, giving you the chance to stream games on the fly with ease. If you find yourself loving it and using it often, you may want to check out that ultra tier, giving you next-gen features like ray tracing, 4K 60fps and ultra wide. PC gaming is, I think, the best way to go about it, but the cost of entry is often intimidating and you have to worry about upgrading your hardware and troubleshooting issues, etc. If you want to get into PC gaming without any of the cost or hassle, then GeForce Now is absolutely the way to do it, allowing you to play hundreds of PC games with ease. You can try it for free by clicking the link below. Thanks GeForce Now, powered by CloudGG for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.